This is Cadillac Unscripted on 107.9 CDY. It's sponsored by Independent Bank. We are talking every week with uh, people who are making a difference in the community, people who are, doing, who are doing great things. And we've had some really good shows recently, Katie Huckle. And uh, what have we got today? Oh, my gosh. Th- this is the mighty bear slayer that we have in the studio. <laughs> recent. Not, yeah, yeah, recent, too. Um, just an avid sportsman, um, one heck of a guy. Anders Garner, welcome. Thank you guys for having me on the show. So can you tell us about your passion? I mean, I know you just got a bear. I did. I got one this morning. Oh actually. my goodness. That's so exciting. I, I got a picture of it. Then I sent Rich the picture of it because I was so excited for it. I just love how the gun was right there. And, you know, I've never had bear meat, but you told me it's delicious. It is. It is absolutely delicious. It's one of those meats that as long as you get the bear uh, cooled down and processed well, it comes out. It's it's one of the best things in the forest. Oh, so. my goodness. So a girlfriend of mine told me a little bit about your mission and some of the work that you're doing with veterans, and it, it touched me and, and Rich, too. And can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing to help people experience your love of hunting and how you're sharing that? Yeah, so I've been I've been lucky enough that uh, we started a nonprof about 25 years ago. I was 14 years old, and uh, – what happened was a kid that I grew up with in the bath bath uh, area right outside of Lansing, his mother had passed away from the flu and he was trying to deer hunt with kind of an inferior thing. Well, my dad had won a 12 gauge with a slug gun on it and we gave it to the family. And a couple months after that, um, a bunch of, a group of like-minded guys were sitting around a table and said, we got to do more of this. Mm-hmm. What can we do? So we started off and I'll, I'll get to what the nonprof is today, but we started off as a, uh, the nonprofit was named Chuck. So we had Chuck Connell over in Marion who's been doing great things with handicapped people over the years, whether it be rabbit hunting or taking him out um, fishing on Lake Cadillac, Lake Mitchell. He's now progressed into where he has a Tails of Wagon bird preserve over there. And Tails of Wagon, up until this year, has been holding an annual veterans hunt. The nonprof that I do business with has morphed from Chuck, which was challenging hunters to use cash for kids, to the PATH Foundation, which is called Passing Along the Heritage, which I currently sit as the vice president of. Cool. So PATH is an acronym for Passing Along the Heritage, the heritage of hunting in the outdoors. Absolutely. How long has PATH been a thing? Well, so we just kind of looped that all together. The, the origins were the the Chuck group, the Challenging okay. Hunters to Use Cash for Kids. And we changed the name. I don't. I, I lived out west for a number of years. So when I came back, I became more involved with the group uh, again. My dad always kind of stayed through there while I was gone. And, and now I'm sitting in a position where I'm next to the top on the board, which... It's your I turn. I don't know what that means <laughs> for me in the future, but that's uh, that's kind of where we sit right now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is something that you grew up with and something that you love to do. And and when I tried it, when I asked him to be on the show, it's like, OK, I've got to fit you in between my hunting commitments here. So can, <laughs> what does a day in the life of Anders look like in the fall? Oh, man. It, so I, I'll give you a brief look of what my week looks like this week. OK, so. Monday, get a call from some folks over by Irons. They had a bear track. I go over there. We, we try to get that bear. I get home and I go, holy cow, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. What do I do now? Well, I with our PATH organization, we have these handicap trailers. So in these handicap trailers, you have a gun system that's joystick controlled. Um, you put a camera over top of the scope and it projects onto a television. So if you have a quadriplegic or somebody who can't handle a firearm themselves you have that scope you move the joystick around put it on whatever animal you're going to harvest and they either have a dead man switch that you hit in order to pull the trigger or we have a tube that you can suck on and that allows them to pull the trigger so i took that trailer down to uh, dennis dobson's place just outside of barrington it's a lake address but he's got a high fence down there called double d and uh, yeah i took that down there because on thursday we start uh, the next, I think for the next 10 to 12 days, we'll run 15 to 17 handicap veteran people. You know, I don't know exactly what everyone's ailment is, but right. 
that they went through an application process with us to get an opportunity to shoot up to 150 inch deer. After they shoot that deer, we get it processed for them. We have a taxidermist over in Bad Axe that mounts all the heads for us for $400. And then next year at our annual banquet, which is held in May, typically it's down in the Grand Blank area. Okay. Those hunters will come back with their families and we'll have a bunch of supporters. We'll do a big auction, lots of raffles, and they all get presented with their deer heads there. Oh, man. Are you getting wow. goosebumps? Wow. That, oh. and, and these are all individuals who are most of them probably were able to hunt the regular way but due to due to various various yeah, issues I, I mean i can give you a few examples yeah. um last year i was on a hunt with a gentleman that uh has als mm-hmm. you know so he's been wheelchair bound for years he's bought some of his own adaptive equipment um in so he has a standing vehicle permit where he can hunt from the vehicle but he still it's hard for him to pick that stuff up so a place like us we give him we do most of our hunts are in high fences because it, it allows us an opportunity to ensure them a better opportunity mm-hmm. to shoot a deer of a lifetime. Contained deer, high fences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, like, uh, the, the Geiger boys, for example. The Geiger boys, they're both out of Bad Axe, um, Caleb and Caden. Caleb and Caden have been on deer hunts with us. I was with Caleb last year when he shot his buck. Um, Caleb's, when I, two years ago, they asked me if I'd run a bear hunt for him. I ended up with a 15-year-old blind kid that I had to figure out how to get a bear to stand still in front of him. Wow. Long enough for the technology to work between the scope and the phone that his dad uses to tell him how to aim and where to shoot. Proved to be a pretty difficult task, but we were able, with the help of some dog hunters, we were able to put a bear up a tree and drag a blind kid in a mile through a swamp. And he, he runs cross-country and track, so he's very athletic. Good. But, you know, we were able to do that with him. And so he's right now. He's kind of my favorite, just because <laughs> well, yeah. he, he was he was my my first hunt that I did on my own with with one of these types of people. Um, two and a half weeks ago, I was over by West Branch. It's a Gladwin address at Paradise Trophy Ranch, and I had a Mitch who's 21 years old with Down syndrome shot a buffalo with us. Oh, my. we actually filmed it. Um, filmed it for an upcoming TV show that Michael Stevens and I are working on. And then the next day, they had one more buffalo left. We had a nine-year-old girl that has like half a heart. She's in a position where if she can stay alive until she's in her late teens, they can find her a heart transplant. But because kids, um, when things go wrong with young kids, normally it's the heart that's affected. So there's not a whole lot of donors out there for a nine-year-old. And she said to us, we were waiting in the vehicle for her and, or waiting in the vehicle for the adaptive trailer to come come over to where this buffalo was so we could get in there and have her shoot it she goes i wish i was normal and i I looked at her i said sweetie what do you mean by that she goes well i wish i had a normal heart like my mommy and daddy you want to see some grown men in a jeep crying at the same time and i looked at her and and i don't remember what i word tracked but i said sweetie it's amazing everybody wants to be something more than normal and all your hope in life is to be normal Right. So those are some of the people that we deal with on a mm-hmm. on an annual basis. It's not day to day. You know, we don't live the lives that their parents have to live, but we hope when we get them out to a ranch or we get them out to do something like this, they forget about what that ailment is and we just they're just like one of the guys or one of the gals at deer camp. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're always striving for. We're we're both <laughs> awestruck. We, yeah, it's, I mean, it, incredible. It, it that ha- it has to be one of the most gratifying experiences that you have had in your life. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, I have two kids, so that you know that kind of mm-hmm. takes the cake on some of that. But for well, even my son, my oldest son Devin, he's a senior here at Cadillac High School. He um, through the tag transfer program which we can get into that if you want to but through the tag transfer program he was able to get a bear tag when he i think he was 14 he was a freshman and he went up to the up a buddy of ours helped us out and he shot a 300 pound bear so i'm talking to him this was two maybe three years ago three years ago i'm talking to him i said you know if if i need to with one of these handicappers can i use your points he goes absolutely he goes i would love to draw a bear tag and donate it to someone like that so I, my big is mm-hmm. my big thing is it's been instilled in me mm-hmm. to be good to others and to pass this heritage along and do all that so i'm trying to do the same thing with my kids 
I'm trying to make sure that they understand that with whether it's great wealth or great opportunity comes great responsibility. And that's we need to be good stewards to the land and we need to be good to others that, you know, can't do it for themselves. Right. The definition of sportsmanlike conduct right there, Rich. Yeah. It well, is. If we, yes, exactly. So tell us about this uh, this television venture that you have going with Michael. Yeah. So Michael and I have put together a pilot. Um, Nine and ten sounds like we're going to be uh, airing either on a Tuesday or Friday evening on CBS. Um, here, we're, we're still working out a lot of the details. What we've done so far is we've filmed our pilot episode. and our pilot episode, we take a 15-year-old kid. And so we've named the show Path TV, so Passing Along the Heritage. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's going to help the nonprof with some exposure that way. Sure. The, the goal is not to create more dollars for the nonprof. I mean, if it happens, great. But it's, it's the path and passing along the heritage is what I'm all about. So it mm-hmm. just made sense to do it. Um, our first episode, we took 15-year-old kid out. We showed him how with rakes that you can rake the ground and you can put rye seed down and have it grow. There's a lot of people that are still trying to bait for deer, even though it's been illegal for a number of years here in mm-hmm. Michigan. Mm-hmm. So my mission is to say instead of, hey, throw some corn out or some sugar beets out, why don't I show you a way that for – 75 bucks after I stopped by Hoagland Hardware and Leroy Milling Company <laughs> that we could plan up to a half acre of this. And we, so we took the video from it. We got some shots from the tree stand. We got Vance out there working and everything's growing like it's supposed to. And it, it's awesome. Right. The second segment on the pilot was we stopped in and saw Ed Shaw over at the Carl T. Johnson Hunting and Fishing Center. And we talked about their outdoor skills academy they do. The Carl T. Johnson runs 20-plus outdoor skills academies every year, whether it be from mushrooming to steelhead fishing to bear hunting and everything in between. Mm-hmm. So we're the plan is with the show is to rely on Ed. I, I'm working on a partnership with the DNR to be able to do it with those guys as a sponsor. Sure. And get out the passing on the heritage. It's heritage, education, and um, conservation-based. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to bring to light the heritage that we've been dealing, we've been dealt here in Michigan, especially northern Michigan. I mean, hunting is in our heritage. Um, we want to do a lot of education with the conservation side of things. If Rich, if you don't know how to deer hunt, I'd like to give a seven minute segment or a ten minute segment on, hey, this is part of the process. To give people a base that are interested in it that have never done it before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just using you as an example, um, conservation is always a big thing, right? We right. want to protect our natural resources. And, I mean, sportsmen do more for natural resources than people will ever understand. You get a lot of non-hunter, anti-hunter people, and they don't understand how you can shoot something and still love it. Oh, right. Right. Or, you know, recently I was out fishing. And my fishing partner caught this beautiful bass, and I wanted to eat the fish. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, I'm throwing the fish back because we're not going to get a slew of fish, and someone else can catch this fish. And I'm starting to um, to learn through, Anders, you and I have mutual friends. These are outdoor hunter people, and I'm learning I'm learning the rules. I'm from South Dakota, so I, I, have a, I was raised by a pheasant hunter. It's a totally different <laughs> game. You know, you've got your Springer Spaniels, and you're out doing a whole other thing. I mean, um, letting a buck go because it isn't big enough, or um, putting, you know, throwing a fish back. I took a fish off and threw it threw it back too hard, and I got a little. Hey, you don't. You can just drop it into the water nicely. <laughs> and of course, I just wanted to get it out of my hand. <laughs> I didn't want to slide me fish in my oh, hand. Oh, come anymore. on. It wasn't that bad, was <laughs> it? wasn't it? that bad, but he also had teeth. So, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I mean, when, when you're with true sportsmen, it's, yes, it's the thrill of the hunt and, and it's the, the shot and all those things, but it's also being in the woods. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I pride myself as I'm more of a bird hunter than a deer hunter. I deer hunt because it's the formality of, we got to go deer hunting. It's November 15th. What else are we going to do? Okay. Um, my my personal thing is I really love running grouse and woodcock. And then I do the pheasant preserve thing with my bird dogs. I have Weimariners. Okay, um, sure. Only one that's a hunter. The other one, he's a, we call him gun sensitive. We want to be PC <laughs> about this. So we call him gun sensitive. Jim is his name. But mm-hmm. Jim loves tracking deer. Mm-hmm. So what we started doing was... Um, 
not this weekend, the previous weekend on Saturday, I had five youth hunters out. Okay. Between various properties and f- various friends, I had five youth hunters out that morning. Uh, my buddy Jason Johnston, his ten-year-old son Brant, shot his first deer, okay. a three-point on a property that my parents owned down in the Tustin area. Nice. And we went and ran Jim on that track, and Jim got to find his deer because it's not Brant's deer if Jim's looking, right? Okay. You got to tell <laughs> okay. Jim, hey Jim, let's find your deer. Oh. And he he loves that. <laughs> it's a, every deer is the dog's deer until you put your tag on it and then you take it home. Okay, so, okay. But yeah, we did that. So we had him out there. Um, my my fourteen year old son was able to harvest a seven point that night. Nice. I was out in the bear stand. Uh, Jason was out in a bear stand with his fifteen year old son Vance. Um, and I had another guy that came up from the Ubley area in the Thumb, and he was hunting another property. Um, I have I have friends that I take bear hunting or people i i'm not a guide i'm on a guide license so i can guide i can get paid for it but that's not my goal okay my goal is to expose more people jason had never hunted bears before okay so rich this this is a mutual friend jason johnson the man got a ginormous bear i mean this thing is was huge 468 and a half pounds Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah I'd like to claim the credit for it, but I, <laughs> but I was just the, I was just the lucky guy that to the mutual friends that we have uh, have Jason. They're like, hey, we got bears behind our house. And I'm like, okay, we'll put a bait in there then. <laughs> and sure enough, we had this big guy who was rolling in. Basically, every day he showed up between seven fifty and eight twenty at night, which is still within legal shooting hours. And he'd skip every four to six days. He wouldn't come in for his early after early evening snack i guess you'd call it but he showed up i had chunks of big rice crispy treats that were all compressed i got a picture of him sitting on his butt holding the rice crispy treat eating it i mean just it was cool i mean we we, we had multiple bears hitting that bait and they to me i was in in 1996 i was 12 years old i'm 39 right now i was 12 years old and we had a proposal come through where they were trying to bear ban bear hunting ever since i've been back in the state i have tried to do something with bears because i remember at 12 years old being at i think it was called laurel manor in livonia and we got a thousand people crammed into this banquet hall my dad is MC in the event. Ted Nugent shows up. Kurt Gibson shows up. And we raise a ton of money mm-hmm. in order to keep bear hunting. It was Proposal D and Proposal G. And what what the hunters did was they ran an ad campaign. D is dumb and G is good. D was where they were going to outlaw bear hunting. And G was where it gave the Department of Natural Resources the ability to manage game. So... D is dumb and G is good. (laughs) You know, what do they say? Keep it simple, stupid, right? Whoever came up with that, I mean, you're listening to it and you you come and you're voting and you're like, what what was that again? Yeah. It works. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as an avid outdoorsman, Anders, um, what is your absolute favorite time of the year? Fall. Okay. I love fall. Okay. Fall, I mean, I can't wait for fall to happen. I'm not a big summer person. Yeah, I enjoy the summers, but I'm a big guy, man. I get overheated, you know, like it's, <laughs> summers are hot. I like it when, when all of a sudden the temperatures are getting getting down to the 40s in the evening and the leaves are rustling and starting to come off the trees. That That's go time. Mm-hmm. That's that's when you uh, when you make the memories happen. So, Anders, you, you're, you're talking about all these different places in the state of Michigan, and I'm starting to get – um, they, I guess, I guess I'm starting to understand that people call you when they want to achieve a goal or a dream for yeah. themselves or for their kid. Or can you talk about that? I mean, I've just been lucky, right? Like I, I'm lucky that I have the contacts that I've made. My dad did outdoor television for 13 and a half years in the eighties and nineties here. Um, how I got the guy, Corey from Ubley is Randy Brown. He's the largest gun dealer in the state. Uh, Randy's hunting center and bad axe. He's a good friend of Randy. Randy and I sit on the path board together. So he finds out his buddy draws a tag, and next thing I know, hey, uh, can you help him out or you get him a guide or something? Yeah, I'll help him out. Mm-hmm. You know? And then Corey, I meet Corey a couple months or a month later. He comes up and runs the beginning bear baits. I showed him a bunch of my spots. I let him pick what he wanted. He was uh, hunting with a longbow. Okay. So I wanted to, you know, I, I don't fancy myself as a bow hunter. Okay. I've done it. I know how to do it, 
But every time I'm sitting in that tree stand waiting on a deer to walk by, I'll see a grouse walk by. Or I'll hear <laughs> geese flying over, and I'm like, yeah, I'd rather be sitting in a field or running the dogs somehow. For me, it's about the dogs. I, I mean, I, from the small game side of it. Okay. I, there, I grew up with English setters and beagles, and I ended up with a hound-looking bird dog. I don't think it's a coincidence. <laughs> But, you know, I grew up on the Rose Lake game area right outside of Lansing. It was our backyard. I remember you'd go let the beagles out. You'd walk back in the house, put your boots on, put your vest on, grab your shotgun, load it up, and step out the back door, and they would already have a rabbit running. That's how I got to grow up. Mm -hmm. I have been so blessed to have the opportunities in my life, and I, I guess it's, you know, now it's time for me to bless others and, mm -hmm. and help them out wherever I can. Mm -hmm. the, the timing on this is just perfect because we're all working to get kids off of phones all the time. You know, we yeah. all want kids outside, more healthier kids, fresh air, exercise, um, and also building relationships and friendships with others. And, and that's part of hunting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have a picture from a few years back um, in my buddy Ed. Again, the same guy who runs the Carl T. Johnson Hunting and Fishing Center. He was sitting out in a blind at my house with his son Colin for a youth season. And they came out of the blind, and but they had left a couple things back there, the gun and one of them. But, I mean, it's right, right next to my house. And so we sent my youngest – well, I only have two kids. We sent both my kids and Colin. Colin and my oldest are about the same age – down there. And we have a picture of them walking down the road with a gun in a case and carrying all the stuff. And to me, that that's a priceless picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's three boys that maybe they don't hunt their entire lives, but have been instilled that value. And they'll always be pro hunting voters. Sure. My goal, my goal is not to make everybody a hunter. I know that, you know, I know that's not going to happen. My goal is if you have a question about it to try to give you the best answer possible. Um, it's just to be there as as a friend. So that's the, I mean I like I said it's we have this heritage of hunting and I want to keep it I want to do my part. So you talked about your dad was your grandfather an avid hunter? So my grandfather interesting enough today I shot that bear with a 35 Remington that was my grandfather's gun. He oh, was wow. in uh he was in World War II and after he got back and I don't know if it was after he married my grandmother or not but that was his gun. He actually passed away when my dad's the oldest of the three boys when he was when my dad was thirteen. Okay. So I never knew the man. Um, my dad tells me all the time that I remind him of mm -hmm. of his father Jack. Jack was his name, and um, but yeah, it's so I yes he hunted, but it was uh, we just had a friend pass away from ALS, a local guy named Dave Gregg. Dave was my dad's best friend. Oh wow! Five years older than my dad. When after my dad's dad passed away, Dave and his dad made sure that my father got out in the woods. Sure. And that spawned on you know he had that love for it, but he didn't have that fatherly figure in order to do that with. So that was that was where Dave became such a valuable person in my father's life, and he came, he was valuable in mine too. I mean, right. I, I've been to West Texas quite a number of times with Dave over the years. You know. It's, I, I really, really miss him. And, uh, and yeah, so I mean, just always appreciated that friendship. So you remember the gifts that you have been given growing up and that, you're passing them along. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. Yes. For, for one of our listeners that maybe is intimidated by hunting, but is interested in it, what would you tell them? Well, depending on what they wanted to hunt and where their interests lied, what I would do is I'd look at, I'd actually, I'm going to plug the Carl T here. I'd okay. look at their Outdoor Skills Academy. And it's, they teach that not for the advanced hunters. They teach that for the people, like their bear class. I've been a part of their bear class numerous amounts of times. Um, that's for the guys starting off. This year I got in the bear bait business. I have no idea why I got in the bear bait business. I just bumped my head and thought it'd be a great idea. <laughs> Do you know what bear eat, Rich? These bait piles are like Twinkies and ho hos and Pop Tarts and yeah. Rice Krispie treats and cow. I mean, it'd be like the Super Bowl for you and me. We, I love, I yeah. love sugar. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, like I mean, my my wife says her spirit animal should be a bear because everything I bring home to feed to the bears like candy corn, sweet. 
so good. She loves the candy corns. My wife is just like, oh, man, I, that box is for me. I'm like, honey, that's not for human consumption, bear bait. I know it looks good, but come on. So what is the bear bait business? You help people? You tell them what? Yeah, so what I did this year was I got into it because of our nonprofit. We take three bear hunters out, typically three or four bear hunters a year. And I saw some of the cost increases coming and availability becoming harder and harder. They've put in some feed lots for cattle and pigs down in Indiana that is taking a lot of that stuff off the market because it's going to feed lots, which is fine. Okay. So I got a hold of a company called Bateman's. They're out of Grand Rapids. I told them what we were doing with the nonprof, and I was able to double their business this year. <laughs> so I, the I bear bought, whisperer. I bought <laughs> a, a, probably 120,000 pounds of bear bait this year, and and I'm still sitting on some of it, but that's okay. It it, it holds over, and it's it's still good stuff. And you know, you know, it's it's funny, Anders, because. We, of course, you, you watch Walt Disney movies and, you know, like, or Yogi, they better like boo-boo and all this kind of stuff. But but you can tell that the artists that are creating these characters have actually watched Bear. Because when I looked at the cam of uh, Ginny and Kim's uh, bears um, in, the, in their backyard, they really were rolling around with barrels of food and laying on their back. And, I mean, they should have had like a like a honey pot, like poo. Or, I mean, they, they get really excited about all this sugar. <laughs> We had we had w- one that he he picked it up. It looked like he had a basketball in his mouth. It was a chunk of that Rice Krispies and carried it off into the woods. Sometimes the game is where did my bucket of bait go? <laughs> Sometimes that's the game you play. You you show up in the woods. You go okay, it's not there. You start looking thirty forty. Oh wow, they carried it way over there. I have one that I don't know where it is this year. <laughs> I have no idea how that I had it hooked on a stump trying to make it a little harder for the bear. I had no idea where he took it. So it might it might be might be here in the TV station or in the radio, <laughs> the radio station, station here. No, but I gave because it's sort of like when you're watching a really good movie and you've got a bag of Twizzlers and you're just shoveling it or popcorn or whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're just having the best time rolling around with all their goodies and their treats. It's a feeding frenzy. Well, you you have to remember too that you're talking about a critter. They they don't hibernate. They think I can't remember the term for it. Um, we all call it hibernating because it's the easiest thing. But they don't actually sleep. They'll get up a little bit and they're active. But this is a this is an animal that this time of year is trying to ingest twenty thousand calories a day okay. in order to build their fat layer up in order to survive the winter. To put that in some perspective for listeners and for you guys, is eleven gallons of acorns. So think of two five-gallon buckets plus another fifth of a bucket of acorns is 20,000 calories. It's a lot. That's a lot. They're mm-hmm. probably feeling kind of sluggish. Well, I mean, how could you not? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so I mean, that's one thing you have to remember. They're, they're trying to load. They still need some protein, and then you use that through whether it be some grains and things like that or granola. Um, but they're, they're wanting to put that fat layer on. So we use a lot. We, you know, I've fed gummy worms. I've fed, I mean, everything, anything that, that a kid would eat, like the 13 year old kid Trowbridge said, I didn't know that you could just take a bunch of junk food and feed it to a bear. <laughs> You're right, Kaysen. That, that's exactly, that's kind of exactly what's going on. You know, when you're talking about this, you're grinning from ear to ear. I think it's your calling, Anders. I, I said when I, I used to own a business here in Cadillac, and I told my mother when I when I got out of that business deal that my goal in life is is I'll probably never own my house on Torch Lake or anything like that, but my goal in life is to give myself to the PATH Foundation and do everything that I can to help kids and people enjoy the great outdoors. So how can people learn about your organization and support you? We, you can go to passingalongtheheritage.com. Um, and, if, and if another thing with that, if you know somebody who's maybe got a disability, somebody with Down syndrome, somebody that's, you know, heart issues and stuff like that, there is a thing on there, an application process that we go through every year and we pick out our hunters based on the applications. It's mm-hmm. going to ask you some very personal questions. I myself have never been through the application process, so I don't I know what it looks like on the back end because mm-hmm. I've read some of the applications, mm-hmm. but I don't know exactly what the process is. But yeah, passing along the heritage.com. I mean, that's uh, where we typically run a big 20 prize raffle, lots of guns and stuff uh, in January. That'll kick off. Okay. Normally sell 1,500 tickets out in 10 to 14 days. 
Incredible. So I think we're going to expand that a little bit in the upcoming years. But, you know, one of our prizes last year was a four person, 200 to 900, uh, $1,500 in trophy fees to South Africa. You know, so we get a lot of people there. I don't want to say coming out of the woodwork, but they come out and, you know, support us. And that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's what life's supposed to be about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. A couple times we got a little choked up in here. I mean, it's really important work, so thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Passingalongtheheritage.com. Thanks for coming on, Anders. We appreciate it. I appreciate you guys. Cadillac Unscripted is sponsored by Independent Bank. Next week, more local chat here on 1079 CDY.